right, everyone, welcome back from break. Uh, I hope you enjoyed the pretzels and chocolate bacon. I sure did. Uh, just <laughs> I just wanted to point out we have a uh, program change. Unfortunately, our scheduled speaker has fallen ill, and we have the good fortune to have Baron Schwartz on hand, and he's going to be presenting a presentation on automated fault detection. And that's why they, they shipped me in, just to be a backup speaker, actually. <laughs> Which did not, uh, my ego did not suffer. I was actually hoping that I would avoid talking because I'm, I'm kind of lazy. Um, so I've spoken the last couple of years here at Surge about scalability and last year about um, pulling packet headers out of TCP and doing kinds of fun mathematical stuff with that. And this is another one of those sort of mathematical fun-ish, but it's not very deep uh, math talks. Um, so hopefully, you know, this is interesting and fun and, um, and we'll get something out of it. Um, my bio is kind of abbreviated here. I've done a whole bunch of stuff over the years. Um, the thing that I'm probably the proudest of is writing this book, which has been doing very well. It's in a third edition now. Um, you can feel free to connect to me on, on Twitter or LinkedIn if you like. And uh, my email address I uh, should have put up there, but uh, you can write me at baron at xaprb.com. That xaprb, by the way, is my name typed uh, in QWERTY on a Dvorak keyboard, in case anybody just wondering. It's not meant to be pronounceable. Don't worry about that. I'm working as a DBA these days uh, at the Rim Kaufman Group, which is a search marketing firm. And we're located in Charlottesville, Virginia, and uh, Portland, and also up in New York and Boston area. And we're looking for some good developers and DBAs, so talk to me if you're interested. So I'm function and, and monitoring is a longtime favorite topic of mine, mostly because I hate them. Right. So monitoring systems suck, and uh, I think uh, I've rarely seen what I would consider to be a, a monitoring system set up well. And even when it is, um, the monitoring systems are generally pretty bad. So the results are generally pretty bad. So, and I'm, I'm talking about things like Nagios and you know all of your standard um, Nag all of your standard uh, monitoring products have these kinds of problems. And what you typically do with these is you'll pick some threshold, like, I don't know, let's say it's CPU. Well, what's normal CPU on the box? I don't know, maybe it ought to be running at 20% or so. You know, alert me if it goes over, what, 95%? I don't know, 90%, what's the right number? Um, so you do this and then you set up your warning threshold. Let's say warning 90, critical 95. Okay, that sounds good, deploy that, and now you start getting spam, right? So this is exactly what happens to everybody. Um, I think thresholds are, are completely bad. The cat has nothing to do with anything, by the way. It's just a cat picture. Um, I think thresholds are bad because there's no right answer. The problem is 95% and 90% on one server um, may or may not be the right amount um, at any given point in time. Let's say that's one of your web servers. What about another one that you just happen to have different hardware on or that gets a little bit different load profile? Um, that one may get very much less uh, CPU usage than 90 and 95 percent. And, and that's just at any given point in time. Things vary from mid-morning to mid-afternoon to late at night when nobody's using the service. Right? So what's, the, what's abnormal? What's wrong? Obviously, 90 percent and 95 percent is a grossly crude approximation. So who does use Nagios here? Okay, so who has a monitoring system other than Nagios that replaces? All right, so we're maybe like 60% and 40%, 60% use Nagios, right? Um, who loves Nagios? <laughs> this interface only a mother could love, right? So like 60% of you put up your hands and I don't see a single hand up for loving Nagios. This is, this is about par for the course. Does Nagios ever send you spam? Who, who let me ask this differently. <laughs> Who has more than 50 servers and uses Nagios and doesn't get spam? <laughs> I see one hand back here. So you, you actually don't have any dev null email filter set up on your Nagios alerts? You don't send alerts from Nagios. <laughs> so it sounds to me like you've moved the filters from your email program into Nagios. <laughs> <laughs> but this is pretty much universal, right? You know, Nagia sends you stuff, and half of it is crap that you don't care about. Um, the worst that I've ever seen um, or, or heard of somebody talk about 
person-to-person uh, -person directly to me, was at an enterprise company. Um, the guy gets 30,000 email alerts a week. And the reason it's a large company with lots and lots of, not just lots and lots of servers, but lots and lots of different systems, all of which have been configured by different people, um, and the monitoring on those systems was configured by different people in many different monitoring systems, and it's all out of his control, and people will set something up and set monitoring on it and then get fired and move on, and nobody knows where the monitoring's coming from. And, you know, so it's just this kind of gargantuan nightmare of monitoring. So that's kind of an extreme, but um, I manage about three dozen MySQL servers today, and um, every morning I just uh, delete about 300 emails without looking at them from Nagios. Uh, I use PagerDuty, awesome service by the way, um, and a very specific email filter to robocall me when Nagios tells me that the, the server has actually hard crashed. Anything else, I just don't, I don't care about whatsoever. So, you know, 300 alerts a day, and uh, right now some of the servers are, are having some problems, uh, so maybe two alerts a day on crashes or replication broken, um, which is already a lot, but two out of 300, that's a pretty high <laughs> noise to signal ratio, right? So this is kind of the reality of Nagios. And when, um, who, was in the, who was in the Kafka talk a few minutes ago? So he said you need to alert, um, monitor your, your rate of uh, uh, consuming messages in Kafka um, because that's one of the best indicators of when something is wrong. And when the rate of messages being consumed is abnormal, then you should be looking into that. And that is exactly the crux of this talk. What is abnormal, right? know what an, an abnormal CPU usage is? How do you know what an abnormal rate of messages consumed is? How do you know when a problem is, um, you know, something that you need to look at? And what I'll be doing is taking a very specific look at this from the MySQL point of view and actually treating MySQL as a queuing system and asking an even more targeted question, which is, how do I know when MySQL is kind of the point where things are bottlenecking? Stuff is getting stuck inside of MySQL. How do I know that without any uh, threshold sort of based stuff, any I, uh, a priori knowledge of what the server's workload is going to be like. And this is not, uh, this is not magic, but on the other hand, it's also not completely foolproof, but I'll, I'll show you kind of the, the thought process that I've gone through and, and how I've done this. So the, it turns out when you try and ask, um, is a, is a metric abnormal, there's already a whole bunch of existing literature and research that's gone into this. I didn't know it, and I didn't know the keywords to go search for it, so when I did things like how to determine whether CPU usage is abnormal, I didn't find anything. How to determine whether queries per second is abnormal, how to determine whether a metric is abnormal, didn't find anything. If I had known about statistical pro process control, um, I would have found it right away, but what I did instead was reinvent it. Uh, and I, I did that a few years ago. This was all kind of intuition, which I assume is how the statistical process control and operations research guys did it to begin with anyway, right? So there's a couple of tools that they've developed, and I just want to walk through some of those because these are exactly the things that I kind of reinvented the wheel in my, in my attempts and found that they didn't work. Um, and I want to talk about what they are and why they don't really work. Um, so the first thing is Shuhart control charts, or just call it control chart. Shuhart is the guy who invented them. And what you do is you take a series of metrics and you take a window, let's say 100 measurements, um, and you take the standard deviation and the mean of those. So the mean is line right through the middle. And standard deviation is um, the, the bars that are above and below. Those are the upper and lower control bars. And in this chart, uh, which came from Wikipedia, there's one. and batteries that are behaving abnormally, I guess. Where is my other microphone? All right, I thought it was when I turned my head, but then it started happening when I was not turning my head. So there may be a faulty wire in the microphone or something too, I'm not sure. Um, so anyway, there's, there's bars here at two standard deviations and three standard deviations. And when the metrics go outside of those, so you, so you take a sample of past behavior and you say two or three standard deviations away from the mean is where these bars are and 
wow, we're outside of three standard deviations. And if you know about standard deviations, that's a very unlikely event. You know, your, your three sigma's out. That's extremely unlikely event. Um, so what, what, the way that this is typically used is for something like, um, here, I just explained what I just talked about. <laughs> Um, the way this is typically used is for something like manufacturing processes where you have, let's say, a part that you're moving along a, a, an assembly line and it's reaching a step in the phase and it's getting a hole drilled in it. And what you do is after the hole is drilled, you have another part of the process that measures how big that hole is. And um, you do this control chart on the diameter of the hole. When the, when, the, uh, when the diameter of the hole starts to exceed those thresholds, you probably have, you know, maybe it's a dull drill bit, maybe it's a loose drill mechanism itself, maybe the jig is set up wrong so the part is not being held firmly, whatever it is, but you've got something that you need to look at. And this is how you detect those kinds of abnormalities. Um, the problem with applying this to, let's say, queries per second on a MySQL server is that it doesn't tend to work very well. I'll show you a little bit later why. A uh, little bit more sophisticated um, you can also do something called holt winters forecasting. There's a couple of different names for that. And this is uh, built into Graphite. It's built into RRD tool. I believe Circonus does this now. There may be some other systems that do this as well. And uh, this takes into account seasonality. So what it asks is, you know, is my website traffic at 11 a.m. today, is it similar to what I would predict based on how things were at 11 a.m. last Monday and the Monday before that? or just, let's say, 11 a.m. yesterday. Um, so you have to know the periodicity, and you have to know the seasonality of these kinds of things, and then you can, you can get some prediction about what now ought to look like. And it's a, um, a long-term thing. You have to have a, a long-term basis of observation to determine these sorts of things, um, but it can be very useful for predicting, for example, what is this year's holiday traffic going to look like for capacity planning, things like that. I think it's very helpful for capacity planning and so forth, but I don't think um, in my observation and experience, I don't think that it's very helpful for determining whether a, st a statistic is out of bounds right now or not. So the problem um, with Holt Winters forecasting is that you'll get unseasonable things or you don't know the periodicity. Um, terrific example is for an online flower shop, you know, Mother's Day or Memorial Day, those are events that drive huge spikes and those things come at unpredictable times of the year. Of course, you can look ahead in the calendar and say that you know that, but are you really going to build that into your monitoring system or are you just going to deal with your alerts when, you know, traffic seems to be um, unseasonably or unpredictably high during one of those, those holidays? Um, there's a, a couple of other problems. You know, you have to figure out the seasonality. What if you're wrong about the seasonality? Um, what if the seasonality of something, you know, again, you have to sort of go into these things with all sorts of knowledge beforehand. And I'm trying to avoid that as much as possible. I'm trying to look only at the data and determine what the data itself is telling me, not what I know the calendar is telling me or, or the hour of the day is telling me or something like that. And of course, you can get slash dotted, right? You can never predict those kinds of things. So um, this is the Corinthians room. So I dug around in, in 1 Corinthians for a couple of quotes. <laughs> and my point here is that the, the real-world complexity of systems kind of makes fools of us when we try and reduce them to things like Holt Winters and Schuhart forecasting and so forth. And there's another Bible quote coming later, so, you know, stay, stay for both Bible quotes. Um, there's another way that uh, I've thought about, which is Brownian motion. Brownian motion is what atoms and electrons and so forth do. They just kind of bounce around. Um, they, they bounce around randomly. Not electrons, sorry. I'm not a physicist, so, so give me a little credit there. But let's say a molecule of air in this room is going to bounce around in all sorts of different directions, and it does what's called a random walk. Well, a lot of statistics theoretically do a random walk as well, especially if it's something like queries per second. You would expect it as it travels along the timeline to kind of hover around the same thing. Maybe it trends up and maybe it trends down for a little while. But in general, you know, it's going up about as often as it goes down, roughly. And if something goes up, several times in a row, that's pretty unlikely. In fact, if we consider, um, uh, oftentimes this is done assuming that it's 50% likely to go up and 50% likely to go down, but here I'm assuming 40% each way, and, and I totally did my math wrong. <laughs> <laughs> okay, the 10% part doesn't matter. The, what matters is the 40% up or down. <laughs> I suddenly realized 40, 40, 10. <laughs> All right, um, I'll fix that before the next time I give these slides. Um, 
so if you do that, you know, if it's 40% likely to go up, then that means that it's 60% uh, likely not to go up. If it goes up twice in a row, it's 60% times 60% like unlikely to have done that. So you can, you can just um, um, you know, take the third or fourth or fifth power of 60%, and pretty quickly you get to see that that number becomes very small. Um, and you can, use, you can compare this to the probability of something being out of sigma bounds. And uh, pretty quickly you, you see that it doesn't take very many um, walks in the same direction to become a very unlikely event. So maybe this is something else that can work. Um, so I had all of these theories about what might work and what might not, and I solicited um, uh, three very simple metrics from uh, a whole bunch of people and got lots and lots of test data from tens of thousands of servers in at least hundreds of different workloads. Everything from simple WordPress blogs to aggregating um, statistics for uh, uh, monitoring systems themselves. So, you know, you name it. I got lots and lots of different kinds of systems, and I tried out different algorithms on them. Um, oh, I forgot to I forgot to show you this little chart. So this kind of shows you the probability of something going the same direction, assuming that there's a 40% chance of it going up or down. Shows you the probability of it doing that um, at n times in a row. So. You know, around 10 or 11, we're getting down to three, um, uh, uh, three standard deviations away. Um, in practice, I've found that uh, many fewer than that is actually already a pretty significant indicator of something unusual happening. So that's what I just said. Um, a key, <laughs> I'll wait, <laughs> a key, uh, a key observation, I think, here is that abnormal doesn't mean bad. I don't really want to get a page or an alert or any kind of a distraction on something just being abnormal. Unless I'm just kind of a curious sysadmin and I spend my time going, wow, that's neat, all day long. Uh, you know, I've got other things to do and I really want to get a, a, um, I want to get some help looking into to periods of time where the system's behavior is abnormal and bad. So that's what I'm really going after, right? I want something that's bad. Um, in particular, as I mentioned in this talk, I'm going to be looking at how I can tell that MySQL is uh, itself is n not just that something badly abnormal is happening, but that MySQL itself is to blame. And this technique can be generalized to any kind of a system. Um, but I have, of course, my sample data that I'm going to be showing you here. So there's a couple of metrics that I will claim matter a lot here. One of them is throughput, and the other is concurrency. Together, as you know, if you've been in any of my other talks on these topics, you can derive an enormous amount of information from these two metrics, um, including you can derive response time. But I will claim, and I'll explain a little bit later, that response time is not necessarily a good thing to use in determining whether your system is behaving abnormally and badly abnormally. And, and I'll show you why in a little bit as we start looking at some graphs of the pretty metrics. So the anatomy of a MySQL being at fault and stuff bottlenecking inside of MySQL is that work continues to come in, but it doesn't get done. So what that means is that more and more things are running inside of the server, so concurrency increases. And those things, if they are of a problematic nature, will prevent other work from getting done in the server, so throughput will decrease. So I'm looking for a simultaneous in increase in concurrency and decrease in throughput. Concurrency might represent as one of two metrics, depending on the way that the application is set up. Um, it could either be the threads running metric, which says how many queries are trying to execute, or it could be the threads connected metric. Um, and these two things happen in, uh, differently in different applications. Um, applications that have a, let's say, Java apps that have a connection pool in front of MySQL typically will not tend to increase the number of connections to the server, because that's fixed by the connection pool. But what will happen is that the threads running inside of the server will increase. Um, many applications that connect and disconnect, like PHP web applications uh, that are not configured with persistent connections, um, will start piling up a whole bunch of new connections to the server. As, um, as connections uh, to the server get stuck inside the server and new connections, uh, um, new requests come into, let's say, the web tier, uh, they will open new connections to the database server, and you'll see the number of open connections to the database server increase. So those are kind of the two metrics that I have seen in production systems indicate when stuff is piling up inside of the server. That and, of course, a decrease in the queries per second that the, the server is producing. So um, I'm 
talking ahead of myself on every slide. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, so I've coded several algorithms. These are perhaps not all going to be of interest to you, but I, I thought up a whole bunch of different algorithms to try and figure out, given these three metrics, where are the bad spots in a server's behavior? And um, I eliminated something that's commonly used with Holt Winters forecasting, which is an exponentially moving weighted average. Uh, it's the same kind of a thing that you see with uh, Linux load average, for example, or, or any system's load average where it's not a true average over a window of time, but it's an average of the current sample weighted with a, um, an exponentially decaying um, average of all of the previous samples that you've observed. So you'll, you'll multiply the previous sample um, by 80%, for example, or 90%, and then you'll weight it evenly with the newest sample. Um, so what you get is a smoothing. Um, and this can be useful for some things, but I excluded it from this because for my purposes, I have all of the data right now I don't need to wait for it to come in because I, I got people to send me samples of data. Um, and also, the exponentially weighted moving averages require a warm-up window, just like any kind of a, um, an, a, an algorithm. Um, for my purposes, I used 60 seconds of a window over which I'm uh, producing an average. If I'm doing an exponentially weighted moving average, I'm probably going to wait 60 seconds for the system to warm up anyway. So these exponentially weighted moving averages save some memory, save a little bit of compute time, but they're a little bit more complicated to understand when you start debugging um, and getting into the, the guts of how the, the system is behaving. Um, and they don't really provide any benefit for, for purposes of this, of this talk. So, so I've just excluded those. So the algorithms that I developed, I just kind of gave names, and you will see these names later showing up on charts. The bad any algorithm is basically Shuhart control charts applied to all three of those metrics. And if any of the Shuhart control charts um, dings that there's an alarm, then I will mark that as a point of interest or a failure in the system. So if queries per second is out of outside of its normal range or threads connected or threads running, any of those, um, then this point in time is quote unquote bad. Bad all is the same thing, but it requires all of them to be bad at once. And I'm just, I'm just kind of going through this, uh, this list of different things that I thought of and tried. The bad simple says queries per second has to be out of bounds, and one of the concurrency metrics has to be out of bounds. So, so I mentioned throughput and concurrency. Here I'm saying that both throughput and concurrency, but I don't care which concurrency metric is out of bounds. I'll take, uh, I'll take it as long as both throughput and concurrency look out of, out of bounds. And the bad deer is uh, the same thing, except that I want them to be directionally, uh, you know, I'm applying a directionality to that. I'm saying queries per second has to drop, because that's what happens. And the concurrency, one of the concurrency metrics has to increase, because that's what, how I know that things are, are piling up inside of the server. You with me so far? <laughs> this goes on. <laughs> this is a big experiment, right? Um, the bad duration is the same thing, but I want it to last for some amount of time. I typically don't want to fire an alert um, the instant that I see something happening. I want to wait a little bit until um, a potentially transient condition has uh, a second or two to clear. And I've done this a lot in, in capturing diagnostic data on real systems. And you generally need, uh, in, in my experience, uh, five seconds of something um, uh, going really bad before you want to gather diagnostic data, because otherwise, if you gather as soon as something looks bad, um, I, I use techniques like these to trigger diagnostic data gathering scripts. If you gather data as soon as something goes bad, in a lot of cases, the system will very quickly recover. It was a transient, you know, it just didn't quite push the system over the edge. Whatever the condition was didn't, didn't really cause a cascading or a long-lived failure in the system. And by the time you gather data and then you try and look at it later for a post-mortem, you're basically looking at, uh, you know, nothing conclusive. It's just, uh, it's not an interesting sample. It was kind of a false positive. So that's why um, uh, I'm specifying that I want to wait a little while and see if the condition appears to be bad for a while before I consider the, the system to be at fault. And then there were two more. Um, the, uh, the Brownian motion runs. I said I want to, uh, um, I want to also flag when the system has runs of a certain length. Um, and I chose three standard deviations. And uh, the same thing with runs, but here I want the runs, the, the last one, bad run, dear, I want uh, queries per second to have dropped, and one of the, um, 
one of the concurrency metrics to have increased steadily for a suspiciously long period of time. So done with all of that. Any questions on those before I plow ahead? Okay, so let's plow ahead. So I graphed, uh, this is like a, uh, six days or something like that of data. I can't quite remember. What is, what is 550,000 samples, one, of one per second? Whatever that is. That's like, a, I think it's a week. What's that? Six days, okay, so, so not a week, but six days. Uh, six days worth of samples. This is from um, a large and well-managed social networking company. And their database servers get a very predictable and stable workload that is very uniform. So this is a very well-behaved system. Um, and they, uh, this is a very scientifically run operation. So, um, you know, in general, I don't expect to see a lot of faults in this system. However, I know that there are from talking to the people who administer the system and from seeing systems like this myself. I know that MySQL is not a perfect system and I know that even on a, a well-regulated and steady workload, it's gonna occasionally have problems. So what I did was I plotted every time that one of these algorithms fired a yes from left to right. And um, from the bottom, there's the bad any. So that's pretty much a constant line. There were like, what was it, 68,000 times, I think, on this sample of data that at least one of those three metrics was quote unquote abnormal according to a Schuhart control chart. This is exactly why I was saying that Schuhart control charts are way too simplistic and they do not uh, reliably indicate a problem in the system. Okay, so one of my metrics is, uh, you know, it's three standard deviations out and that's theoretically uh, uh, unlikely to happen, but in the real world, <laughs> obviously it happens all the time, right? Um, same thing with, um, uh, the, the bad simple, which is that uh, the queries per second and one of the uh, concurrency metrics is out of bounds. We, we get a bunch of those. It's not a completely solid line, but it's still a lot of stuff. And the bad directional the one, the one that I've charted at, uh, at point 0.6, by the way, the vertical position here means nothing. I just wanted to separate these visually so that we could kind of see how many of them were, were plotted. Um, the one at uh, 6 on the x-axis, the purple boxes, that is the Queries per second dropped and one of the con uh, concurrency metrics spiked um, abnormally. Um, the right above that is a little hard to see um, from the projector, but the bad duration, that's the same thing, that's that bad direction, but for some duration of time. So we got two of those samples, and then we got tons and tons of bad runs, and we got two places where the bad runs went in the wrong direction, where the queries per second dropped and the concurrency increased. Does it make sense? So basically I found lots and lots of spots which may or may not actually represent bad behavior in the system. And um, I, I wrote a script to pull all this stuff out and graph it with GNU plot. And then I wrote a script to go over each of these and graph a, a region of data around each of them. So obviously I have you know tens of thousands of graphs to look through should I care to do so. Um, and I'm gonna show you a few of those. So here's one of those samples where the bad directionality algorithm fired. It said queries per second has dropped, and you can see that in the, in the uh, graph at the top. This, this little blue line has notched down pretty significantly, you know, outside of three standard deviations. And on the bottom, it's a little harder to see because the, uh, the threads running, the green line is pretty sloppy, but it goes all the way up to here. So threads running, which normally is, you know, um, kind of flopping around in the 10 or 15 range, occasionally spikes up a little bit higher. Here it's going up to, what, 110 or something like that? Um, so that looks pretty bad. You know, a lot of stuff was running inside of this server for a short time, and not many queries were actually completing for that, for that period of time. So this definitely looks to me like this is something that I would have liked to have captured diagnostic data and be able to drill into that and see. Maybe it was, I don't know, an alter table on a small table. Maybe it was... Um, you know, a short stall inside of InnoDB, there's literally dozens of reasons why um, a system like MySQL and InnoDB might stall, and this is not unique to MySQL or indeed to any database server, but this, this happens with all kinds of servers. I'd like to know why. So that's kind of the purpose of this, is to, is to um, you know, maybe you use it for alerting, but the, the purpose that I'm developing this for is to gather diagnostic data for analysis later. So would you guys agree that this looks, you know, suspicious and bad? I don't see anybody disagree. <laughs> Here's another one. Um, this is one of the bad Dur samples, which means that something went bad in the right direction for a long period of time. 
Um, this uh, queries per second was down for some duration, and the uh, threads running was up for some duration. So it basically looks the same. And by the way, the um, the red line that's kind of zigzagging up and down here in the middle of the chart, that is threads connected. And that has to do with cross-country transactions. Apparently, I've, I, I've never had my hands in these systems. This is the only data that I've ever gotten from these systems. But I asked about that, and, and that uh, pattern is very consistent and repeats constantly. Um, apparently, there are periodic jobs and cross-country transactions that cause sort of a, a resonance effect across the country that create this, uh, this fluctuation in the number of connections to the database server. So that's not really bad, um, but just sort of the way that this thing works. But what's bad is when the, the uh, number of queries trying to execute is up over 100, and we're getting less of them done. So here's a sample of that long run. So we had you know, the queries per second dropping successively for some number of samples in a row. And the, and the, uh, in this case, the threads running, um, increasing for some number of samples in a row. Um, so this one, again, looks you know, potentially not as bad, but maybe it looks like something interesting. So I, I actually went into the, the uh, file of metrics here and dug this out. And you'll have to pardon me, because there's just a bunch of numbers on the screen here. But I've highlighted the ones of interest. First, on the left-hand side here, we have the queries per second in column number two. And you can see that that is steadily decreasing from sample to sample for uh, six samples in a row. And threads running is increasing for six samples in a row. Um, and these, these little flags here indicate how, how, long that, uh, um, how long that run was. Basically, if something continues to get negative, it means that it was uh, um, constantly decreasing. That, those numbers get reset back to zero by my, by my program every time the, the, uh, um, every time the statistic stays the same or changes direction. So you can see that, yeah, you know, there was a, there was a clear trend there that was all in the wrong directions. Uh, but if we look back at that, uh, look at that graph again, I would argue that this actually does not represent something bad happening in the server. Um, because what looks to me like what happened is that actually queries per second spiked up. And I'm calling it bad when it started to trail back down. And, you know, something was draining out of the system for some reason. Um, it's not quite clear why that happened, because at the same time, the threads running spiked down. So maybe there was an application restart upstream or something like that. Um, or maybe there was a short-lived application that did a bunch of work. Uh, you know, it's hard to predict exactly what this was because I don't have any further information about this system. But it does not look to me like stuff was stuck and, and trying to execute inside of MySQL. So the direction itself, even though it is um, potentially, you know, it's something you could say was very improbable for there to be successive runs of these statistics, um, I, it was not what I would call a fault inside of MySQL. So, you know, you're, you're basically getting my brain dump as we go through these, these slides. You're, you're seeing how I sort of worked through what works and what doesn't. And I'm, I'm marking this one off. I don't think this one works. So, based on this, I went back to my sample set of data, um, a portion of it. It's kind of large to crunch on my MacBook. And, um, and developed a couple of new algorithms to see if I could pull some more information out without so many false positives, see if I could get, um, I, I'd like to get one algorithm that reliably gives me problems, doesn't miss any, and doesn't give me false positives. That's kind of the holy grail. I'm not there yet, but I'm significantly further there than I was a couple of years ago with Shuart control charts. So I, I adjusted my algorithms, and then I created a new combo algorithm where I said, there's a bad run and the bad run coincides with queries per second dropping and concurrency increasing. So this sounded promising. And I, I reduced um, my duration uh, to three samples in a row. Because actually, when you think about it, um, what we're dealing with here is not completely independent variables. But um, we don't necessarily have to have 11 samples in a row of all three of these statistics to conclude that something is very abnormal. Um, because the probability of there being um, queries per second increasing, or sorry, decreasing for a certain number of, of samples in a row is, uh, let's say, at three samples, what was that? That was like um, 10 or 20 percent or something like that. And if you multiply that by the probability of another one also happening at the same time, assuming that they were independent variables, you know, so getting a couple of these samples to, to move in directions at the same time 
is less probable than um, than it would seem. So I shortened my number of um, my number of samples for that threshold so that I would try and capture more runs. So I, I plotted it again and drew the new the new algorithm up here, the combo algorithm with little triangles, and it looks like I found a couple of points of interest. Um, and I dug into those, and yeah, you know those those definitely look like points of interest. So that seemed pretty successful. Um, this is on one sample of data. Uh, maybe we can take these techniques and move to another server because this is one workload, and you know this has all been kind of developed assuming that this workload represents your general purpose workload. So, um, uh, sorry, before I go there, let me explain why not response time. I told you earlier that I didn't want to use response time as the metric of when something was bad, and that's because workloads change. Um, let's say there's a cron job that just spams your database server with lots and lots and lots of little one row lookups and then it switches you know it's gathered a whole bunch of data and done a whole bunch of work on it and then it switches into some mode where it's doing long operations on groups of rows at once um, now that it's kind of done with the calculation period uh, what you could see there is that you could see the response time very short at first and then increase and if you triggered just on ooh my response time has increased then you would be triggering on something that's just the way your workload is. I mean, your response time is going to fluctuate just like everything else. So, so I don't want to. I don't want a response time only based um, heuristic here. I want a, a heuristic that kind of takes into account the way that that I expect things to flow through my database server. Does that make sense? So I applied my algorithms to another data set, and I was very disappointed that my snazzy new combo algorithm didn't plot anything up here. Um, but this was the first thing that I looked at. And everything else looked reasonable. You know, it looks to me like there's some uh, large number. This is, um, this is 11 days worth of data, I think, in this sample. Um, there's some large number of things that are happening for a particular duration at a time. And that doesn't look unreasonable for 11 days worth of operation of the database server, um, particularly if the database server is not behaving very well. You know, that, that could easily happen. So you know, this, this looks reasonable. Um, I had no prior knowledge, by the way. I had not peeked into this, this database server's metrics. This was my first look at it. So let's see what happens. This one looks very different, um, completely different, in fact, from the, from the first sample that I worked with. Threads connected stays pretty much rock steady. I don't know whether this is uh, something with a connection pool or, or whatnot. I'm not sure about that. Um, but it's, it's very steady for the most part. Uh, queries per second seems to jerk up and down a lot, and the threads running seems to kind of hang out in the range of 8, 9, and 10 a lot. So it's a really different workload than what we were looking at before. And it does seem to have sort of detected something bad here. Queries per second in this, in this example dropped way down here. Um, by the way, I didn't explain this, but I have drawn a, a vertical line on the graph to represent the point at which the, the fault happened. I plotted the particular fault here, and there was an earlier one there as well. Um, but uh, anytime you're looking at this graph, wherever this line is, that's, that's where I've fired my alarm on. So it looks to me like threads running increased from 9-ish to 10-ish, and queries per second went from 200-ish to, what, 80? Oh, sorry, from 2,000 to 80, sorry. So orders of magnitude decrease. So it looks like something bad happened there. So I'm like, okay, this is cool. You know, finding, finding problems in a different workload. And then <laughs> this is the next one. <laughs> How are you going to detect normal and abnormal on this kind of garbage? <laughs> right, so, so um, paging through lots and lots of graphs from this one, I realized this server has a very... Uh, mixed and unpredictable workload, and we're going to get lots and lots of this stuff. And I don't see a fault there. I mean, I see scribbles. I see like an earthquake <laughs> on a seismograph. Um, but I don't see anything there. I, I, I see the server got some work to do for a little while, maybe some job fired up, and you know there was a, there was a bunch of work going on here, and then it kind of finished, and maybe there's some other work here that's happening less quickly. Um, but I can't say that that represented a point where things were really bad in the server. But our faithful Shuhart control charts told us that there were. In combination, you know, all the, the jazzy combinations that I've done here, they said there was probably a problem in the server there. 
So we got a false positive, and there were just this this server was just littered with false positives, and the the patterns were very pretty to look at, but not something I want to be alerted about. So here's my second Bible quote: <laughs> I've been defeated. <laughs> I've been too crafty. Um, so the the workload is something that I think we ought to. Um, before we apply these sorts of algorithms to them, maybe there's some jazzy algorithms that I haven't thought of yet that can make sense out of that garbage. Um, but I, I have no ideas. I have no intuition or inspiration yet. Um, so what I want to do then is constrain this to workloads that I think I can probably make sense of with this tool. So the next thing that I did was use a variance to mean ratio. I've, I've talked about this before. It's also known as the um, index of dispersion. And it indicates basically how um, predictable and steady and consistent a workload is. And it's something that you can, it's uh, um, dimensionless, unlike the standard deviation, which has dimensions that are the same or, or related to the input data. This actually is, um, it has dimensions, but it still is just a number that can be compared from data set to data set, um, which is why it's really useful on things that behave very differently, on servers that have lots of fast queries versus servers that have lots of slow queries. You can generate this index and then you can compare the two and say, is this one more variable than that one? So what I want to do is say, I'm only going to apply this technique to servers that have um, not too variable workload, because I think that'll help me. You know, if the workload is not too variable, then maybe I can apply my, my fancy algorithms. So um, this is my still life with purple line. The purple line is the variance to mean ratio, and I just took one of those random things um, plotted the, the variance to mean ratio on it, and you can see it's kind of going all over the place. What I wanted to do was sort of see, well, what is the variance to mean ratio? On a really well-behaved system, I kind of like to see it below 10 um, or, or even lower than that on a, a really rock-solid system. Um, but in this case, obviously, you know, it's spiking up to about 1,000, and it's doing these nicely decaying and nicely increasing curves. And then it's suddenly dropping down and so the variance to mean ratio is pretty wild here as well. Um, that tells me what I already knew, that this, this workload is pretty crazy. The higher the variance to mean ratio is, the more variable the workload. So here, um, you know, here we've, we've had a really variable workload. Sometimes queries per second is touching zero, basically. And sometimes it's up there around, what, 5,000 or something like that. Um, that's extremely variable. And the variance to mean ratio here is of the queries per second, the throughput. So, you know, the, the variance to mean ratio gets high and then it trickles down as the workload stabilizes a little bit. Um, you see it, it increases a little bit, though the workload got a little bit messy here again. We had a, a jag there as, as we had a sudden dip here. And then we had this nice increase again as the workload went down around zero and got really wacky again. Right, so it doesn't matter whether we're down here or up here being wacky. The variance to mean ratio is going to give us an indication of how wacky the system is behaving. Right. So when in doubt, um, use empirical metrics. And what I did was I went back to my uh, first data set and said, that was pretty well behaved. You know, that, that system was something that seemed to respond pretty well to these modeling techniques. So where was the variance to mean ratio in that? And um, what I did is I actually took the, uh, um, the 99th percentile, or uh, the 99.7th percentile, actually three standard deviations, of the variance to mean ratio on, on the first workload. And it turned out to be at 335. So I just took that as, um, as my number and plugged that into everything going forward. And um, then working again on my second workload, uh, I got pretty good results out of this. Basically, I will only allow my filters to fire when the system has had a variance to mean ratio over the last 60 seconds of 335 or less. Does that make sense? So we got a bunch of points. Um, and uh, it looks like there's some points of interest here. Definitely something that it's easy to look into, you know, just these couple of points, the, the blue points there, um, or even any of those purple boxes. So I, I grabbed some of the graphs from those, and this is, this is the result. Um, indeed, I, I paged through a ton of these graphs, and I did not find the kind of uh, bizarre false positives that I was seeing before. So, so this made me happy. You know, right here, um, queries per second is dropping. Threads connected is increasing. We get the same thing here. Queries per second is dropping like all the way down to zero, and something is some small little spike there in, in uh, um, threads running. We get pretty much the same thing on all of these graphs. You know, we're, we're getting a really major drop in queries per second, and at the same time, there's queries that are trying to do their work. So I, I think 
that this is probably good enough for me to use to fire diagnostic triggers on a wide variety of, of workloads. And I, I went ahead then, um, you know, I mentioned I have thousands and thousands of servers to, to, um, to run this across. I went ahead and ran it across a bunch of them. Um, there's, in, in my opinion, there's never going to be a substitute for, for looking at these graphs and saying, am I getting false positives? Um, I looked through a whole bunch of them. If, if you want, I can show them to you. Um, I have them on my laptop, but uh, we are at uh, pretty much around the time when I should start taking questions. Um, part of the questions can be showing you those graphs if you want. <laughs> um, but in any case, I think that this, this algorithm is now working um, reasonably well enough for me to, to try and roll it out onto some real production systems and see what kind of, of results that I get. Um, and I have, again, I've, I've done this kind of thing before and gotten mixed results, so this gives me a lot of hope for better results. So my conclusions um, that workloads are different and we need something that understands that or at least doesn't fire alerts uh, or false positives willy-nilly on that. I don't just want unlikely events. I don't just want my Brownian motion going in the same direction or my Shuhart control charts or my Holt Winters predictions. Those are, those are way too simplistic and we need to take into account what really happens to a system when things go bad. Um, I don't think that traditional techniques are good enough. I think we need something that's both more sophisticated and more sort of common sense um, at the same time. And um, the, the math here is not hard. Uh, this, this is basically just doing some averages and some sum of squares, and then you get your standard deviations and your variances for, from that and you know, counting the number of times things happen in a row. So, so this is basically addition, subtraction, and multiplication at a square root. Right, so there's nothing hard here. And I think, question mark, that automated problem detection is a good thing. I certainly, I'll tell you this, I would put this into production any day, right now, with no further, uh, with no further tweaking or questioning. I would put this into production right now and get the alerts from it before I would set 90 and 95% CPU utilization alerts on systems. I am 100% confident that I will get fewer false positives and that m these algorithms will adapt themselves to the particular machines that they're running on rather than just setting some arbitrary thresholds across the board and then, and then having to set up s uh, spam filters on my email inbox. So that's all I got. Um, questions? Let me, oh, you've got another mic? Okay, good. Um, how do you choose the time interval that you're using? You, you chose 60 seconds, but uh, is that dependent on workload? Or And also, uh, you're for the variance to mean ratio also, you're, it's a moving average? Or variance to average? mean ratio is calculated over the same window that everything else is, so the previous 60 seconds. Yeah, how I chose 60 seconds is a great question. Um, I was talking to, was it AppDynamics yesterday, and they told me that they're, they have some uh, similar problem detection um, thresholding stuff in, in their system and it operates on what the system has been behaving like for the last two hours. In my experience, anything longer than a minute or a couple of minutes is uh, paying attention to, to data that's way too far in the past. The systems that I work on tend to change quite rapidly. Um, for example, uh, there's a couple of businesses that I've worked with that do um, apparel sales. There's you know high fashion accessories and things like that. And they'll send out an email to their subscribers and say, get your Gucci bags now while they last. And that system goes from zero to 60 in 30 seconds. You know, um, we're talking from 8,000 queries per second to 24,000 or from you know, even, even more dramatic uh, uh, changes than that in just a matter of seconds or minutes. So I really don't want to be looking at two hours of data. I think, you know, it, it, a minute was kind of just my gut judgment. Um, I said I don't like setting thresholds, but you saw that there were lots of magic numbers in here. Two standard deviations, three standard deviations, 60 seconds, 335. You know, where did those magic numbers come from? Those come from my, basically from the observations and from my experience. Uh, uh, how, how do you um, accommodate the outliner? Like, suppose my application is doing more query per second, like, because of some advertising or something. So how's the algorithm is going to accommodate those things? Are, are you talking about a sudden spike in activity? Yeah. Yeah, so sudden spikes in activity are actually what I want this system to cope with. Um, a sudden spike in activity is great. There's, there's something I didn't really go into. Um, 
if you're just saying, wow, I've got a lot more going on in my system than I normally do, that may or may not indicate something happening inside of the application, uh, inside of the database server. A good way to create something like that is to shut down and restart your application servers. You will see activity drop, and then you will see it suddenly spike again. Or maybe you change your load balancing, um, and you suddenly are redirecting a whole bunch more queries to one of your servers than you were before. Um, that's not a problem as long as the system is not bottlenecking and the work is building up inside of it and, and not getting done. So I, I want this system, and I believe that this system does, handle um, changes in workload as long as the changes don't indicate something bad. So you clearly spent a lot of time working on the algorithm. Do you see this generalizing at all to like other types of metrics, um, other than like just MySQL queries per second? Yeah, so do I see this being able to generalize to lots of different things? I think, so the, the data that I'm working on here, the, the combination of metrics, specifically throughput and concurrency, is a little bit more complicated than a lot of systems that you might apply this to. Um, I think simpler techniques ought to, I would like to, to prove this for real, but I think simpler techniques, um, the, the same techniques ought to work on simpler sets of data such as CPU usage, which is a single metric, right? So I believe so. I think it's I think it's generalizable, but I'd like to prove that. Um, why don't you, um, you know, there's a lot of other information you could correlate with this, like lock weights, you know, those types of information in the database, reads, reads, writes, all that kind of information. Yeah. So you correlate so some of that to your model, and you might be able to filter out or really focus on what is problematic. Right, so uh, the previous question was about generalizing. This one is about making things even more specific. Well, I, I think that's maybe what you need. It could be appropriate, but on the other hand, I think this is good enough. And okay. I've found that when you add more and more data in, you quickly become very overwhelmed. Um, and Maybe somebody's got some AI systems out there that handle this, but my poor little brain does not. So. You know, application-specific data, such as knowing that there are lock weights going on or something like that. Sure, I've built systems that have deep domain knowledge of MySQL specifically, for example. They will capture data when um, threads, not just threads running goes high, but threads in the statistic state goes high, which is when the query is being planned. Or well, when there's too many lock weights inside of MySQL, instantaneous conditions like but that. In but in terms of read, write operations, things like that, all those things kind of play a role in what's actually behavior you're looking at in the system. My gut feeling about that is that it's going to be way too complicated to make sense of it. Really? Yeah, yeah, because okay. I've done this for a long time. You know, okay. I've, I've, been, I've been looking at lots of correlated metrics for a long oh. time, and I think it's going to be very difficult to, to actually make sense out of all you that. Don't, you don't think like multiple regression analysis? Anything like that, Mark? Maybe multiple regression analysis could do it, but uh -huh. you know, I think what you would end up doing is saying, wow, this looks unlikely. And I think we've already seen that there are things that are extremely unlikely that don't indicate anything bad in the system. Well, so. I mean, I was looking at a lot of that stuff and just, just the behavior of certain things happening. If you had possibly additional information, you might be able to. Yeah, I'd, I'd actually be interested to try this. I'm just, I'm, you know, I'm not, I'm not trying to, to naysay. I'm just saying that I, my gut feeling is it's unlikely to yield, but I could be wrong about it. So I think on one of the slides you specifically said that you don't want to be alerted when um, you want to be alerted when something goes wrong in MySQL itself, and you don't want to be alerted when it's caused by some third party, like some external factors. Let's say more queries from the application, right? But what happens if you turn the same statement the other way around? So let's say something drastically happens, uh, some drastic change happens in the workload, right? and you still have enough resources to hold it on MySQL box and you don't fire any alerts, but that, on the other hand, causes your response time for your application increase like 2x, let's say. Right, okay, so, so I think what you're saying is can we use the same techniques to discover when MySQL is okay but something else is not? What I'm saying is that I always thought that I would prefer to receive an alert that my response time or seed somehow on the graphs for the website is up to X, and I would at the same time prefer to receive an alert that something is wrong in my SQL, 
rather than not receive an alert about MySQL and just go and try to find out what's happening in MySQL, my, my or if it's MySQL or not. Because okay. your uh, variation to um, your variation to dispersion ratio, right? The filter which you introduced, it will cut out essentially any drastical change. So your algorithm won't fire any alerts, no matter no, what. No, it, it'll it won't cut out a drastic change. What it'll cut out is a drastic change that occurs after a whole bunch of drastic changes have been happening repeatedly. Okay. Okay. Yeah, but I, you know, your point is a good one. The reason that I don't do that is that many applications have sufficient complexity and sufficient numbers of tiers that I don't want redundant alerts. You know, I don't want a an alert on MySQL when I could be observing the um, I could be observing these same metrics, by the way, on Apache or just on TCP traffic coming in from my load balancer, and I could fire the same kind of thing and say, "There's a problem at the web tier." Um, at or below the web tier, but I don't want to be alerting at or below the web tier, at or below the database tier, at or below the I.O. tier. <laughs> you know, I don't want to alert on all of the tiers. Basically, what I want to do is alert on the topmost tier at which the problem is observed, and then I can drill into that from there. And that is a good case for having lots and lots of statistics that you can then look at lower tiers and line things up and see, well, these things are correlated. You know, there was also something happening inside the database. But you have to distinguish between cause and effect very carefully. And I don't want to get alerted on effects as much as I do on causes. And we've got time for one more question. <coughs> what exactly is your number for the throughput? And the, what, what's the scale of that? Or units, I guess. Um, this, the units are just um, plain old numbers. But my uh, x-axis is logarithmic. So that one's kind of small. Let me get a bigger one. So you know we're up here. This is the the second server. Um, it has a, a lower workload, but here's ten thousand. Here's one thousand. So you know this one's hovering at what that's going to be two thousand. It's like twenty five hundred, three thousand queries per second. I graphed these on a logarithmic scale so that I could put them all on one chart without completely drowning the smaller numbers. Um, I'm not a big fan of logarithmic scales in general, but it's uh, having things on one graph is obviously pretty important for this presentation. Otherwise, you'd never be able to see them. Thanks.